All right, and I'm gonna move it forward one. There we go. Okay, so I've talked about the cover. Okay, moving and it forward. Go, one more. There we go. So this is actually about page 18 or so of the book. This is how the key starts. So there's a set of choices like, is it a gilled mushroom or is it a non-gilled mushroom? And then I show photographs to show you what the different kinds of gilled mushrooms look like and then the different kinds of non-gilled. But I carefully chose the photographs to go into this part of the key to be to complement the photographs in the key itself when it gets started. So these are all images that do not appear elsewhere in the book. And then on the far lower right side is the name of all the little uh, images you're looking at. So first you decide you have an ascomycete, a basidiomycete, a truffle, a, a puffball, and then you go to that section of the key and it tells you what page to go to. So go to the next slide. Sorry, here we go. Okay, and, and here's the last of the key. Uh, so it's, it's three pages that take you to the major groups. And then the page that's numbered 11 in this thing is where the key itself starts. So what I've done is gathered together the mushrooms that look, th that are closely related. In this case, Craterellus tubeformis, Craterellus calicornicopioides, and a young and an old Turbinellus flocosus. And so there's comments on how you tell these things apart. So next slide. So here is, and, and this, by the way, pardon the quality of the photograph. I didn't have, I don't have the book yet. So I put this on my computer and then I was photographing my computer slide to create these images. So these are, are not the images that you would see from the book. But I wanted to see, want people to see how I handle like the chanterelles. So one, cantharellus formosus. Now you notice there's the word group after it. We now know that there's four different species that we've been calling cantharellus formosus. But they all share a sort of a dull yellow cap and a dull yellow uh, ridges underneath. Where cantharellus cascadensis, number two, immediately to the right, has a very bright yellow cap, but it has white uh, on the uh, fertile layer. And it's closely related to cantharellus subalbidus, which is white on the, on the top and on the fertile layer. And then cantharellus roseocanus. So this is all four of your chanterelles and I've got them all clustered right together so you can compare and contrast. And the comments section tells you where to find each of this, these species and how you tell them reliably apart. And then on the next side, these are things that all used to be chanterelles. When I started out, Gomphus clavatus was cantharellus clavatus. And uh, so you can see what that looks like in relation to the true chanterelles, and then polyozelis. Now, these were this was all polyozelis multiplex. We thought there was only one species, and then about four, uh, five years ago or so, uh, the folks on the east coast got curious because they thought they were finding two different polyozelis species, and I got involved in the last minute. We thought we had three polyozel and now it turns out we have four polyzella species in North America, three of which occur in Cascadia, and, I, and two of which occur in the Columbia Gorge, and I have pictures of those two, polyzellus atraagulinus and polyzellus very margaretae. Now these, these two things are actually uh, what we, they've been called blue chanterelles, but if you look at them, they're in the Telepheraleys. So they're a very, unrelated mushroom. And the gomphus thing is actually related to the coral fungi, related to Romarias, and not at all closely related to Cantharellus. So what I've tried to do is cram as much information in a tight, small package that you can carry with you into the field when you're out identifying mushrooms. 
and then compare and contrast to help you identify and get the right species. Next. And this is one of the courts that I found under the oaks, Cortinaris valingi. It's named in, in honor of uh, Elsie Valinga at University of California, Berkeley. And the large, the one on the right is about the size, a little smaller than a dinner plate. And this thing I found within walking distance of my house. It had never, it is now also been found in California and a few other places. I'm sure it's probably in the Oak region in Oregon as well. But this is one of my new species of Cortinarius, of which let's say there's over 50 of them and we've got about 25 of the 50 named at this point. So a lot of Cortinarius species left to be named, but this is a really fun one. We don't know anything about the edibility. I'm betting it's edible. I, uh, Cortinarius has a reputation of not being edible. There's one deadly species. And actually, when I look at the data for the North American, uh, all of North America, the genus with the fewest reports of all genera in the whole uh, of North America is Cortinarius. And yet by far and away, the largest genus in all of North America is Cortinarius. So most of these Cortinarius species or edible, they're just not incredible. But you do need to be aware that one of them is deadly. Next. So this is another one of the ones that, uh, that I found under the oaks, Cortinarius albo lilacinus. It turns, it starts out a beautiful lilac and then fades to white. And that's why Dr. Amorati chose the name albo lilacinus, white, so lilac going to white, just an absolutely gorgeous thing. Uh, these were growing in the back and in, in the uh, winery at uh, Syncline Winery over near Lyle. But I found it since then in many, many other places. Hmm. But it, here's this big, beautiful mushroom. Some of these things the size of a dinner plate, they're all unnamed, they're all unknown. It was just absolutely stunning to me that there were so many things out there that nobody had paid attention to, but they tend to start fruiting in November and, <laughs> and they require a hard freeze or two before they start to appear. But if you get a really hard freeze, they don't appear at all. So some years there's none, some years there's 50 species. It's just an incredible game to try and figure out what you're gonna find and when you're gonna find it. Some of these mushrooms I've only seen once in the 15 years I've been studying them. Uh, some of them I find almost every year. Next. So this is another one of the uh, ones that we've gotten named Cortinarius amabilis. Give you an idea of the variation. When it's young and primed, it's just this incredible, almost iridescent lemon yellow color. Beautiful, beautiful mushroom. Very, very distinctive. So far, as far as I know, known only from the Columbia River Gorge. This one has not been found elsewhere. And I don't think the Albolita sinus has been found elsewhere yet either. So these are a couple of my brand new species. Next. Now this is a really interesting mushroom. I don't have anything to give you a size reference, but uh, the biggest caps in there were about the size of a luncheon plate. And we sent it in for DNA because I'd never seen anything like it. It's a sarcomyxa species. Now the late oyster mushroom, Pinellus serotinus, is now been moved to sarcomyxa because it's not related to the, the other mushrooms in the Pinellus genus. And so this is a genus that has three species total. This thing, the, penel, the little uh, late oyster mushroom and an, one called Sarcomyxa edulis that grows in China. <laughs> but this thing when it's young is just a gorgeous blue. And then in age uh, and later on the gills are yellow and the stipe is yellow. It's a massive thing. I found it on two adjacent oak stumps. 
David Aurora got, got so excited, he jumped in his car and drove all the way up from California to see the thing after I posted pictures. Nobody has ever seen anything like it anywhere in the world. And it grows about 10 miles due east of me. Uh, I, I don't feel that I want to name it myself. I've sent it to Scott Redhead to name it years ago. And uh, he has not yet put a name on it. But one of the exciting things about it is it lasts and lasts and lasts. It doesn't rot. So Paul Stamets is really curious about whether or not it might have some anti-insecticidal properties or other properties that prevent, I mean, the slugs don't eat it, the insects don't eat it, it doesn't get wormy. It lasts for almost three months before it rots away. And of course, there's nothing known about the edibility. Let me try the next slide. I think I've got one more picture of this. Oh yeah, okay, here's, Here's my hand in there. So you, this is the same collection, just a, uh, about uh, three weeks later on. And uh, let me try one more slide and see what I've got in the next one. Ah, this is what it looks like when you grow it in culture. Completely different color, but just absolutely gorgeous mushroom. So one question I had, is it edible? Would you try and eat it? Well. I wouldn't try and eat it until I got the DNA results. In the, and since it's two other members, there's only three members of the genus, the other two are both edible, I figure this one is probably edible. And when these mushrooms growing in this particular culture were really young, just primordia, a couple of the primordia broke off. And so I cooked them up and ate them. And it had the most amazing, pleasant texture. It didn't soften and get mushy like mushroom, like most mushrooms do, but it didn't stay hard either. It was just a delightful texture, wonderful flavor, probably the best mushroom I've ever eaten. And so when the mushroom got mature, I took, I ate some of these bigger ones and they numbed my mouth and made my throat constrict a little bit. And I said, hmm. I'm not gonna eat any more of these. And so I've given it up as an edible, but I think it's gone extinct because I've never found it anywhere other than these two stumps. And it's been eight years now and the seven years actually, and the stumps are pretty well rotted away and it isn't fruiting anymore. But we have it in culture, it's in the national culture collection. So if anyone ever gets interested in it, we can pursue it and do some more things with it. So that's my story of this sarcomyxa. It's still a total mystery, but a big, beautiful, gorgeous mushroom. Next. So here's the sarcomyxa serotina, which has been Penella serotinus. Now, the interesting thing about this particular photograph, I photographed these mushrooms in, in the main picture, January 3rd, 2010. It was 10 degrees Fahrenheit outside when I took the picture. It, there was four feet of snow on the ground. Oh, can you back up? Sorry. There was about four feet of snow on the ground. It had been below 20 degrees for two weeks. These mushrooms were not frozen. They were warm, they were fresh. So what I've discovered is really actively growing mushrooms can produce significant metabolic heat and don't freeze. And I've seen the same thing with King Bolitz. Uh, in the gorge one, one year, it had been freezing for a week. All the waterfalls were frozen. All the mushrooms were frozen. All the big mature King Bolitz were frozen, but there were four buttons that weighed about a pound each and they were warm, fresh, delicious, just perfect condition. So, you can actually do some mushrooming in the winter sometimes uh, and make some very interesting and amazing discoveries. Okay, next. And then another interesting thing, I thought all three of these species, you know, I, I, I thought this was a mushroom called the giant oak polypore. And it has a white spore print, I had checked the spores against the, the white 
uh, giant, the giant oak polypore. And this turned out to be a, something completely different. This is a perennial mushroom. And this turned out to be Fomitopsis fissurata. And it grows in my yard. And yet it had never been reported from anywhere in Cascadia. And, but it's all over the place and it grows right at the base of oak trees. And you could see some uh, oak uh, acorns laying in the picture. And, and so this is something that almost went into the book as one species. And I got the DNA results just back, just in time to rename this thing because I had named it something quite different. Uh, but this is Fomitopsis fissurata, a perennial. Next slide. What I thought it was, was Pseudohinonotus dryadius, the giant oak polypore. This is an annual mushroom. It, this thing was about three feet in diameter. It's growing about a mile from my house. You can see the white spores underneath, so it's white spore print. But look how knobbly it is on top. But I was really amazed to realize that an annual could grow this big and be this hard and this solid. And so you can, in the lower left-hand corner, you can see the butt of my silky saw where I had sawn one of these things apart to get a look at the inside. It looks every bit like an annual mushroom, but in a year it's gone. Now in the lower right, there's a mushroom without a name on it. And I'm, if I look out my window, yeah, there it is right there. Growing on my tree, it's a totally unknown mushroom. Nobody's ever seen anything like it. I thought it was the same as the Pseudoinonotus dryadius, but it's not as knobbly. And the spores are exactly the same size as the uh, Pseudoinonotus uh, dryadius and the same size as the spores of that Fomitopsis fissurata, but they turn red in Meltzer's the other spores don't. And so it's a completely different species. And right now, the one in the lower right is out for DNA analysis, so I can try and put a name on it. So the, one of the things I wanna note is I've been at this for 50 years. And this year alone, I found 10 species I'd never seen before in my whole life. And, and most of those on my own property, and I've been, I bought this land in 79, so I know this land well, and yet constant surprises, constant new things out there. Next. Can we try another slide? Uh, you didn't. Oh, okay. And also under the oaks, there's these, some of these really beautiful boletes that you don't normally see. This is Oreo boletus flaviporus. Uh, very interesting thing, kind of slimy. It's edible, but not worth not worth messing with. So let me figure out how to signal. So go ahead and change. But this is one of the uh, oak uh, bolletes. Now this is my favorite oak bolete, Buteri boletus quercy regius. Now, this is just a single specimen. I photographed it both standing up and then I picked it and laid it down and put the inset so you can see the underside. So we've got a blue staining bully. Now, almost all blue staining bullets are bitter and you don't want to eat them. Uh, this one, however, is distinguished by having netting at the top of the stem. That big one weighed about three pounds, by the way, and it's a very, very tasty butter bully. Buteri boletus, meaning butter and buttery. And they're buttery yellow in color. They don't taste like butter, but that's a very delicious, uh, good edible bolete. Not quite as good as a boletus edulis, but definitely up there in one of their better eating mushrooms. And I had never seen anything like this before. Now, this these collections from my property are, are actually part of the type collection when this mushroom was named a few years ago. I didn't name it myself. This was named uh, the work with Noah Siegel is doing, uh, but, uh, oh no, I'm sorry. This was something that, uh, not Noah, David Aurora 
was was working on. But I sent in samples of this thing because they had no idea that it grew other than in California. So this is considered to be a California species. And a lot of the things that I'm finding, a lot of things in the book are California species. And especially if you get <coughs> into, you know, go right over the Cascades, do uh, head due west from you, where you guys are, you'll find a lot of these California mushrooms that have crept up into Southern Oregon. Next. So this is how I've handled the Boletus edulis group. These are all very, very closely related to edulis. They're all delicious. They share a characteristic that the sponge when the mushroom is young is white and the sponge turns olive uh, in age. The stipe is netted. You can see the netting really clearly on the Boletus multiae, which also has a somewhat netted cap. The best tasting of all the boletes is Boletus borosii. Now, that's not a mushroom I've ever found myself. I would think you'd probably find it in the Ochocos, and I've only done a little bit of hunting in the Ochocos, but it's a, an east side dry uh, species uh, associated. Uh, you can see this is with, under Ponderosa pine, but that is supposedly the tastiest of all of the boletes. I don't find it, uh, this is of the King Bolete group. Boletus fibrolosis is the rarest and the least tasty of the edulis group, but it's still a very, very good edible. And Boletus reginius, which is supposedly only associated with oaks. Now notice all the oak leaves in the picture. Uh, <laughs> oh, that's ponderosa pine. So um, you probably have Boletus reginius down your way. For a long time, I could not tell it from the king bolete, Boletus edulis. Boletus reginius is the queen bolete. When it comes time to eat them, you can't tell them apart. But reginius often has this gray uh, frosting over it when it's really, really young. So it's this beautiful frosty gray. And you can wipe that frosting off and then it can be very dark. It's often kind of black. These were covered by needles, so they're fairly pale but a very, very delicious edible. So I find edulis starting in late uh, July at around uh, 4,000 feet. And then uh, it fruits like mad uh, through September. And you begin to find it at lower and lower elevations, clear in through uh, November down uh, just outside of Portland. Usually it typically associated, associated with spruce trees, either at high elevation altitude or the coast. And what I don't have a picture of in this group is Boletus edulis variety grand edulis, which looks very much like edulis, but it has a redder cap. And it's associated not with spruce, but with, with the lodgepole pine and with uh, some of the hardwood trees. And it's found primarily right on the coast. So Boletus edulis variety grand edulis. And the thing I like about edulis is it's so meaty and it's really easy to get your, your limit. And they're very, very distinctive and very delicious. So the way I've set the book up though, is I have all of these pictures on two facing pages so that you can compare and contrast. And then the comments will help you sort between the various uh, King Bolites. Next. So here's your chanterelles. So Cantharellus roseocanus is distinguished by having really, really bright gills, but a dull colored cap. And that, that this is the one known as the rainbow chanterelle. Subalbatus, white cap and white uh, lamellae. Cascadensis, really, really bright yellow cap, but white lamellae. And then Formosus, the group, sort of the dull egg yolk colored ones. Next. <clears throat> Next slide. Yeah, I did it. Uh, you're not getting it yet? Oh, there we go. And so these are some of the things that used to be in the Agilis group. So here we have Polyozelis atraagilinus, which by the way, for those of you that do dye mushrooming, is a very, very um, good mushroom for uh, for dyeing silk and wool. 
it's a mediocre edible. Some people say that Gomphus clavatus is quite tasty. I also find it's quite wormy, so I've never eaten it. And then Paleozelis mary margarete can be hard to tell from Atrazulinus. You have to use a microscope, uh, but it's also a very good dye mushroom. Now I leave this Craterellus calicornicopioides for last for a very specific reason. One, it's one of the very most delicious of all mushrooms. And it, the trumpet part, the top is always black and the underside is always kind of gray. And it's only under oaks. Now look at all the oak leaves in the picture <laughs> and uh, the color. I was certain I had a new species, absolutely certain. And yet this thing is an exact match by DNA to Craterellus catacornicopioides. And this is found about a mile down the hill from my house in an area that's right now scheduled to be clear cut. And I've only found it in this one patch. So I've been trying to get it protected. But here we have a variant uh, that is highly desirable, highly prized edible. It dries beautifully and gets a more intense flavor after it's been dried. But it should be black on the top. And I've got both photographs in the book so people can, can see both. But I was really shocked and somewhat disappointed that I hadn't found a new species, but shocked that I'd found such a different species from what it's supposed to be. <laughs> Next. Now, have here we have some of the ammonitas, and it's really important to be able to tell the ammonitas apart. Now, when I did a workshop for the Washington Poison Center last week, I didn't put the labels on the two, but notice the coloration of ammonita clyptoderma, an edible ammonita, and the coloration of ammonita phylloides, deadly poisonous ammonita. They both start out looking very much the same. They look like a, uh, basically like a puffball, but when you cut the puffball open from top to bottom through the middle, you see the developing stem and cap and gills, and you know you've got an ammonita and not a puffball. So it's really important to know ammonita phylloides. It's a native of Europe. It came over uh, on the nursery stock probably about 100 years ago. And it got introduced both on the East Coast and in the Bay Area. And it's been spreading north from the Bay Area. And it's now as far north as uh, Victoria, British Columbia, and Vancouver, British Columbia. But you'll mainly find this along the I-5 corridor. And it has begun to associate with a lot of our native trees and has become quite widespread as soon as you're west of the Cascade Crest. So it's really important to know ammonite phylloides and how you identify it. And the other thing about it is that the cap can be pure white, the cap can be bronze, the cap can be green, or it can be sort of this greenish bronze that you see in this picture. So quite a variable uh, mushroom. Now, Ammonita uh, ocreata uh, in the also in this picture is deadly poisonous as well. And it's a native. It's been here all along. This is a California uh, photograph. I can tell from the uh, leaves that are the oak leaves that are in it. We don't have that kind of oak up here. But this mushroom grows at least as far north as Vancouver, Washington. And it's associated mainly with the lowlands and along the rivers. And then I thought the mushroom in the lower right image with Ammonita clyptotoides, which is somewhat closely related to clyptoderma, but Ammonita clyptotoides is only known from uh, one or two spots in California and one spot near Lyle, Washington. And then I found this collection right along the Columbia River, right uh, directly below my house, about eight miles away. And it turns out by DNA to be Ammonita obconico basis, a mushroom known only from one other spot 
and it's a spot in Southern California. So uh, I thought I had Kleptotoides. It looks very much like Kleptotoides. I was wrong. It's Ammonita obconical basis. No idea whether it's edible or not. I'm not about to try because that's exact. That's, look, look how close it is to Okriata, which we know is deadly poisonous. Okriata, by the way, and phylloides are two of the, the most delicious mushrooms you will ever eat. Although you may not eat any more mushrooms after eating either one of them. Uh, but I, I have uh, interviewed people who've reported that, that they were absolutely delicious. Uh, some of them have survived actually with good medical treatment. About 95% of the people who eat phylloides or okreata can be saved if they go to the hospital right away, and if they get a doctor who knows what the heck he's doing. Next. So here's some more ammonitis. These are ammonitis in the vaginata group. They don't have a ring on the stem. All of them are um, edible. None of them are incredible. And I have had one poisoning by somebody who thought they had an ammonita in the vaginata group, one of these, but they had an ammonita phylloides where the ring had rubbed off. So don't go messing around with these. And these vaginata group ones are extremely variable, extremely hard to identify. And Lindgreniana is one of the new ones that I'm working on right now with Janet Lindgren on getting it named and with Rod Tullis from, from New York State, who will be the person who actually names it. Okay, next. So we were talking about Ammonita aprica showing up around Bend. So here's Ammonita aprica, a spring mushroom. I find that it generally starts to appear around May. Uh, it has its main fruiting in June, and uh, but it'll, be found clear on into July, sometimes August at higher elevation. And then there's Ammonita muscaria and Ammonita alpinicola. Now these things are all closely related to muscaria itself. They all have exactly the same toxins, mucimol and ibotenic acid. They can be lethal to dogs. And especially if the, if the vet treats the, the dog with atropine, Ammonita muscaria contains a toxin called muscarin. And muscarin, the antidote for muscarin is atropine. But atropine will magnify the, the poisoning effects from the ibotenic acid and the mucimol. So a doctor sees the atropine, the, the uh, muscarinic symptoms, treats with atropine and kills the dog. And we had a case this year where a doctor treated a human with atropine because of the, seeing the muscarinic symptoms and almost killed that person as a result. Now, I didn't put that in print, uh, but you really have to know what an ammonita is in, in these groups. So Aprica alpinicola, we now know somebody's eaten it. So it also has the same toxins. I'm sure you have alpinicola in your area as well. You'll probably mistake it for a faded out aprica, but it, it, it should be uh, in the Ochocos and it should be in the, in, on the west and east side, mainly on the east side of the Cascades. So it's something you should be finding down around Bend. Now, muscaria itself, the distinguishing feature are those three to four little bands of tissue at the base of the stem. And you can tell you have a muscaria. Ammonite muscaria can be white, it's commonly red or orange. It can be yellow, as in this case, it can even be dark brown. But always the base of the stipe will look like you see in this muscaria in the image. Next picture. So here's Ammonite pantheronoides, and you distinguish it from the muscaria group by having a rolled color vulva. Can you see this where I'm moving my... Oh, you, at the base of the stem on the one on the left, the pantheronoides, you just have a single roll collar of tissue. Then that tells you you're in the pantheronoides and gemata group. Now, gemata itself probably isn't toxic. 
years ago, but it integrates with panthronoides. And years ago, I looked at mushrooms that were quite yellow versus dark brown versus all the shades in between. And I found that the darker the cap, the more ibotenic acid and musimol. So this has exactly the same toxins as Ammonitum muscaria and Ammonita aprica. Panthronoides, I would expect, would be very, very common down around Bend. This is one that I get in my yard here uh, in the Columbia Gorge. Uh, but and this is one that dogs, it's far more toxic even than muscaria if dogs or humans eat it. Next. So another mushroom that's really important to know, and, and we've been getting a fair number of poisonings, is Ammonitis smithiana. And it's classically mistaken for Tricholoma berylianum. Now, which some of the, I first learned as Armillaria ponderosa. It's had many different names, but, and there is a Tricholoma magnivillari, which is what we've been calling this, but it's in the east. So our Western species is Tricholoma merylianum. Now, this is, merylianum is a highly prized mushroom. If, if the one that was turned up on the lower uh, right, uh, lower, lower left, I'm sorry, had a full vulva, I mean, it had a full veil, didn't have a break in it, it would be worth about $100 in Japan. Just that one mushroom sells for a massive amount. So how do you tell the white masataki from the Ammonitis smithiana? Now, Ammonitis smithiana has an interesting toxin, actually probably a couple of different toxins in it, but it shuts down your kidneys. You, 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 uh, you, you have this urge to pee and pee and pee, but you'll wind up in the hospital probably for a couple months uh, on kidney dialysis till your kidneys recover, but nobody's ever died from it. But the difference is if we take a look at the shape, it tapers to a point like the matsutake, but the base of the stem is bulbous where the matsutake tapers all the way from the gills to the tip in a smooth taper. Now, if you lay the stem of a matsutake across the palm of your hand and squeeze down on the stem with your thumb and squeeze with all your might, nothing's gonna happen unless the mushroom is wormy. It's really dense, it's really hard. If you, if you do the same thing with an ammonita and put that in the palm of your hand and squeeze with your thumb, sure, it doesn't break, it's nice and firm, but you squeeze with all your might and the mushroom just explodes, it shatters. So smithiana is much softer texture than uh, the white matsutake. The other really neat way to tell the two apart is cut the stem with a knife. On Tricholoma virilianum, the stem is so dense that the knife squeaks when you cut it. It does not squeak if you try and cut an Ammonitis smithiana. So be safe with the, with the Tricholoma virilianum. You guys down there in Bend are in major uh, Matsutake country, but make sure you don't mistake smithiana. It, it can certainly grow in your area. Next. And there's a huge amount of interest in turkey tails, Trimedes versicolor. And so, and as a result of that, I devote an entire page to turkey tails in my book because people are constantly sending me pictures. Is this a turkey tail? Is that a turkey tail? Well, there's about 12 or 15 different species that look straight down from the top, look like a turkey tail. So the trick, to doing a turkey tail is to turn it over. It has small white pores on the underside and it grows on hardwoods and it's always on hardwoods and it always has those small white pores. Very variable in color, but very easy to tell from its lookalikes because none of the lookalikes have small white pores. So if it looks like a turkey tail on top, and they're all thin fleshed. They're not a big, thick, meaty mushroom. I've had people pick uh, uh, Fomitopsis muncii, this big woody conch, and say, hey, did I find a turkey tail? This is, these are turkey tails. 
And I'm interested in turkey tail in particular. I have a friend that uh, was diagnosed with extremely aggressive prostate cancer 11 years ago. And he had surgery. They had to take out not only the, the prostate, but part of his bladder. And the cancer had metastasized and spread. They wanted him to do chemo and radiation. He accepted the radiation, but didn't accept the chemo. But instead, we got him on a regimen of using the uh, host defense cap, turkey tail capsules that Paul Stamets markets. <coughs> and so he held the cancer at bay for 10 years. And then he, for some reason, well, he was doing a lot of diet changes and other changes. And there's a lot of things that they did to try and survive, cut out sugar from the diet. But about a year, uh, well, I'd say almost two years ago now, he quit taking the turkey tail capsules. And then when I talked to his wife in June of last year, he was down to about 106 pounds. And they figured he only had days to weeks left to live. And I talked to him a, a bit and found out they hadn't been taking turkey tails. I had him get in a big shipment of turkey tails, but I also had learned just about a month before that about this guy in Alberta who makes mushroom creams, and he shipped him some turkey tail mushroom cream that you apply externally, and his PSA went from 400 down to 26 in six weeks. It's now down to five, which is the normal level for a male. He's in his 80s. And he's gained, he's back up to about 130 pounds, which is what he had weighed normally, looking good, cross country skiing, hiking again. So I'm tremendously exciting, excited about turkey tails. I mean, this may have been a fluke, it may have been a one off, but this is one of the medicinal mushrooms that I really and truly believe in. And I'm convinced that it has saved my friend's life. Next. So here's turkey tail lookalikes. Now notice the sterium complicatum from the top looks a lot like a turkey tail, but when you turn it over, it's not only orange, but it's smooth. There aren't little tiny pores. Burkandia adusta uh, has little pores on the underside, but they're gray, they're not white. Trichiaptum abiatinum looks like a turkey tail from the top, but underside it's generally violet. And the things are a sort of ragged, uh, tooth-like structures. And then Tremetopsis cervina, which wasn't going to be in my book, that I found at the very last minute, found it for the first time in my life, again, about a mile from my house on some logs. Uh, there were no pictures in Mycomatch, or, or what used to be called Matchmaker. And so here's another thing, looks like a turkey tail from the top, but as soon as you turn it over, you realize it's something completely different. So these are how you get the, stay away from the fake turkey tails and stick to the real thing. Next. Next. I did it. Oh, okay. This was not gonna be in the book. Uh, this is Brigiaporus nobilissimus. And Jim Goon sent me the little photograph in the upper left. I have never seen one of these mushrooms myself. Uh, the, the one that he's photographed, this is Jim in the photograph. He's photographed beside, they call it the green lady. And it's one of the rarest of all polypores in terms of fruiting bodies. But if you, and it grows on noble firs and I've looked for it and looked for it for years and just amazed at what it looks like. So we've got a young one in the upper left and a mature one to see how it compares. Don't ever pick one of these if you see it. It's an endangered uh, species, highly protected. And it, it lives literally for hundreds of years. Um, so leave it in place. But the neat uh, thing about the thing is if you start looking at the DNA on the trees, in the needles and in the bark of the trees, it's one of the most widespread and common polypores in existence. It just 
doesn't fruit. <laughs> so it's out there, but never produces a fruiting body to, to get to see. So Rigiaporus nobilissimus, far and away the largest uh, of the uh, polypores. Next. Now here's some uh, edible polypores, some fleshy ones, Albatrellus avalanius, Albatrellopsis fledii. It used to be Albatrellus fledii, but they found out it reacts differently from to Meltzer's reagent. And it also, when you look at the DNA, it's not closely related. In the middle, I have a picture of what I had called Albatrellus confluence, but there's some question, I. We now suspect that confluence does not exist at all in Cascadia. And that what we're looking at and have been calling confluence is what happens to Fledii when it fades. And I can see a little bit of blue in the left-hand specimen of that Fledii in the middle image. And so I'm pretty sure that's a picture of what we've been calling confluence is actually faded Albatrellopsis Fledii. And Albatrellus ovinus is another rather interesting fleshy one. Scudder juralisii used to be in the Albatrellus uh, genus. Uh, it's distinguished by that had very tomentose cap. Now, all of these are edible when they're young and tender, but they're a little bit tough. And so one idea I've had, if you really want to try and eat them, is cook them in a pressure cooker because you can soften and tenderize a lot of these somewhat hard mushrooms. And you could probably uh, tenderize and eat the stipe of uh, matsutake, for example, if you used it in a pressure cooker. Now, the Albatrellus avalanius and the ovinus, the pictures I show look very, very different, but they overlap in appearance when you're actually looking at them in the field. So they can be a little bit tricky to get a positive identification on. But I wanted to emphasize that you can play around with uh, some of these uh, fleshy polypores and, and try cooking them. They're mild tasting uh, and maybe by pressure cooking when you're desperate, you could get yourself an extra mushroom meal. Next. And then there's the woody polypores. Fomitopsis officialis, uh, agaricon grows primarily on uh, Western larch, but it grows on a range of conifers. I've seen these things, they tend to be no bigger around than the one in the image, which is probably about the diameter of a dinner plate, but they can wind up growing to be three, four, five feet long. So they're, they tend to often be cylindrical in appearance. Uh, Fomis fomenteris, uh, which is known as amadou, is a really, really neat mushroom. Uh, it was the mushroom carried by Otzi, the Iceman. They used to use the inside of that mushroom to carry a, an ember from a fire around. And you just wrap it up uh, in a piece of leather and keep it closed. And then you set your fire, put a little bit of the, uh, of the uh, conch next to the fire and blow on it. And you use it before you have matches. It was also used medicinally. But one of my favorite things is my hat made out of the pond pounded interior of Amadou. And it makes it soft, it's light as a feather. You don't wanna wear it in the rain because it begins to smell like a mushroom out in the rain. But you can make beautiful purses, wallets and things out of Amadou. And it's an industry in Eastern Europe. Now, Ganoderma organensi is closely related to Ling Chi and Zhu Ling and uh, is an interesting met medicinal. That one is an annual. Uh, the Fomis fomentarius and the Fomitopsis officinalis are both perennials. And these are all of interest uh, as medicinal mushrooms. But the information and data, I, I don't have any exciting stories about them. Uh, how, they go how good they are as medicinals is something that I, I still wonder about. I, I'm not, I don't have a closed mind about it, but these aren't things that I pursue for medicinal mushrooms. Next. And now the morels. And the mushroom I held up earlier was Morchella brunia. 
And in fact, uh, the mushroom I held up was from the exact spot where this Brunia photograph was taken under some cottonwoods. Murcella populophila is a rather interesting and very different mushroom. Pardon me for a moment, my cell phone is going off. Uh, that's my uh, time to take my evening med. It means it's eight o'clock. Uh, so I better talk faster. Populophila is really delicious. It's listed as unknown edibility. I've got to figure out how to turn this off just a minute. There. And since it was unknown, I cooked these up and ate them. They're really good. Morcella snideri is characterized by uh, growing in dense clumps. Now the pets on snideri can be burgundy, they can be green, they can be brown, they can be tan, uh, quite a range, but, and the ridges don't start out dark. The ridges on Brunia are dark from the beginning. Morcella snideri starts out paler, but turns dark in time. And then Morcella eohespera, which has been re renamed Morcella norvegiensis, turns out to be one of the most common mushrooms in Cascadia. And I thought it was a rare mushroom. I named it from uh, a, a single site in, uh, in Gifford Pinchot National Park, National Forest, I'm sorry. And I found my collection at the same time as a friend of mine in, Nor in uh, Newfoundland found exactly the same thing. We sent it in for DNA the same week. And we, now, and we named it Eohespera because Eos for the Greek god of the sunrise, Hesperus for the Greek god of the sunset, because all the black morels on the east coast are different from the black morels on the west coast, except for Importuna, the landscape morel, and Eohespera. But it turns out Eohespera also is found in Norway. And we went to Norway to try and find it and couldn't. And nobody knew for sure what Norvegiensis was, but since then it's been found in Norway, the DNA confirms that it's the thing I had called Eohespera. But it's found in China, it's found in the Alps, it's found all over, and yet it had escaped naming until very recently. Uh, so there's always new surprises out there, even with the morels. Next. And now we have the uh, Morcella americana, the uh, Esculenta clade morels, and they differ from the, from the morels that we've just been looking at, that if you try and follow the ridges, the ridges are random, they go all over the place, where the ridges on a, on a black morel, now I have a blonde colored black morel that Maggie Rogers is holding, and so, and it was originally named uh, by uh, Michael Kuo as Morcella frustrata because it's shaped like a black morel and colored like a blonde morel. Uh, but it is a very delicious uh, edible that'll often grow in small clusters. And then in the lower left, I have two different burn morels. The, on the very far lower left is uh, uh, is Morcella um, tomentosa, and, and then next to it is Morcella eximia. Morcella eximia is, the, is one of three burn morels you really can only tell apart by DNA. Uh, and the pits can be pink or green or tan, and it'll soon lose the pink color and turn all brown. And so this is your most common burn morel but when it's done fruiting, which tends to be about June, maybe into early July at the highest elevations, then Morcella tomentosa on the far left starts fruiting. And it can sometimes fruit if there's enough rain all the way until the snow falls in the fall. So if you want to find morels in August and September, go to the burns where there's been good moisture and look for Morcella tomentosa. It starts out very fuzzy and almost black in color, but those little black hairs don't grow as the mushroom grows. They're still there in the big mushroom, but it's expanded. And then it has a color much like Morcella americana. Now, in addition to americana, we have another Esculenta clade out here, Morcella 
Java, which I have found uh, in the Metolius area, and it has a darker pit than the uh, Americana, but otherwise is very similar in appearance and edibility. Next. Do we go on? Yep. Okay. And then there's, we get into some little tiny ascomycetes that are only of curiosity. There's a thing called uh, alder tongues, Tephrina occidentalis. And it's a fungus that infects the cone of the alder tree. And those green, those red things that you see are actually deformed growth of, of the alder. They're not a fungal growth, but the fungus will be will produce spores on those tongues. And the tongues will overwinter and turn black. So Tephrina occidentalis uh, is, is a cute little cutie that I'm interested in. And then here's a pair of mushrooms that aren't in my ASCO book, Cudoniella clavis and Pisoloma celiifera. I found both of these at Little Crater Lake, which some of you folks may get up to and hunt at. And uh, little tiny jelly mushrooms on sticks, the Pisoloma. I didn't even see when I took the photograph. I was photographing the Cudoniella clavis, which itself is only uh, about as wide as my fingernail. And then when I looked at the pictures, I said, oh, I caught two different species. <laughs> I had no idea what Pisoloma celiifera was. I had to send photographs and samples to, to Germany to get it identified. And then in the lower uh, left-hand corner, Chylomenia stereo, ster, stercoria and Laziobolus cuniculi. The Laziobolus is the little white thing. The Chylomenia stercoria, the much larger mushroom, is, uh, is the orange thing. Uh, and what it's growing on is a single pellet of oak dung, of elk <laughs> dung. So to get an idea of the size, you, you know how big an elk pellet is. I, I really was lucky to get this picture and still have it in, in, in focus. And then Bisonectria cartilaginea is a really interesting thing. It forms primarily where the pica, the pica or pica, uh, these little rabbit-like creatures that live in the uh, talus slopes. In the winter, they all, year, they all defecate in exactly the same spot. So if you pick this, thing up, it's held together by this sort of paler uh, yellow orange, uh, it's called a subiculum. You pick it up and turn it over and it's just covered with rodent, rodent dung on the underside and the fruiting bodies are on top. There's a very similar mushroom, uh, Bisonectria uh, terrestris that forms uh, at lower elevation where the rodents have urinated, but it doesn't have the dung underneath. And that's how you tell the two apart. Next. And then there's the lactarius things. And we think we know what's, what's going on. I don't even know the lactarius deliciosus mushrooms that are growing on my own property, which are the two on the right. And on the lower left is a lactarius species that fruits by the hundreds on my property, totally unknown. I'm sending it off for DNA. Next. And we'll close this program with my favorite edibles, the uh, bear's head and the lion's mane mushrooms, the hericiums. Now, I once found with my students a, a, a hericium arenaceus that was big enough to feed 20 students for two days on a field trip. It was bigger than a bushel basket. So there's a close up of the teeth of the bear's head on the right, upper right and the upper left shows the bear's head from a distance. But my very favorite edible of all edible mushrooms is the Hericium arenaceus, the lion's mane. It grows on oaks and it grows on maples. And the one in the photograph weighed about 12 pounds and you slice it like meat and saute it on both sides and it tastes like lobster. And then Hericium coralloides is this very branchy, feathery thing. It's not as meaty, not as good eating, but the Hericium arenaceus is exciting, not only for the fact that it tastes like lobster, but it has the ability to regenerate neurons and might help stave off Alzheimer's. 
The same is also true of the bear's heads. So eat as many of these as you can find, as often as you can find them. Uh, after the eruption of Mount St. Helens, the bear's heads grew by the tens of thousands on all the dead trees. So look for a downed conifer tree with its base near a creek so it stays wet and you can often get this wonderful treat of the bear's head. This has always been my students' favorite mushroom of the whole year, but they've never gotten to eat lion's mane because it's not as common uh, since it's a hardwood mushroom. And I believe that's it for the program. Let's try one more. I think it's over. Yes. So okay. questions. 